You're listening to the Subrogation Support Network, a podcast from Atisant, Wickard, and Layer, America's subrogation law firm. With dissemination of new developments and changes in subrogation law, as well as emerging trends and best practices. Here's your host, Ashton Kirsch. Hello, everybody. This is Ashton Kirsch with Matisse and Wickert and Lair. And today we have the Subrogation Support Network podcast. I am honored and privileged to have Valerie Steinbeck joining me today. Uh, I'll let Valerie give a little introduction. Uh, Valerie is with Crawford and Company. Uh, she handles cargo claims. She is the team manager of the Inland Marine Cargo Division, I believe. Uh, Valerie, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Ashton. Thanks very much for having me today. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, mm-hmm. This is going to be a really interesting and impactful topic. Uh, one thing I'll mention to everybody is, you know, Valerie and I, in preparing for this, uh, we decided to have this podcast because we are actually speaking for uh, CLM on a webinar on June 5th. So if you're able to attend and if you're a member of CLM, if you're not, consider becoming one. If so, jump in, join us for that webinar. This is going to be kind of a brief recap of the topic as we do in these podcasts, but the webinar is going to go into depth on these issues. And uh, of course, uh, we're all here for answering your questions. But you know, let's start out with just a brief introduction of cargo claims, right? We're talking about all kinds of cargo claims this presentation, but the, the primary type of claim is you know commercial auto, damage to cargo, either en route, at location, and the claims arising from that, both on the subrogation end, which is really what I handle, right? We represent either the shipper or somebody else that owns that cargo and it's damaged or another motor carrier that's pursuing a claim against someone else down the line. And it's really about the damage to that cargo. Uh, these things can get really complex, especially in today's age of global commerce. Uh, I get, I like to give an example in my presentations. Imagine this: most products are manufactured in other countries and have to be transported here. Uh, so example being a uh, Something product, a bunch of widgets manufactured in Poland, and they have to be transported to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the area where I'm from. So in that situation, it's manufactured in Melbourne, Poland, uh, transported by a truck to Warsaw. From there, from Warsaw, it's on train to Rotterdam. Uh, From Rotterdam, it goes on an ocean liner to New York. From New York, it's a train to Chicago. From Chicago, a truck to Milwaukee. Um, This is one of the almost less complex than a lot of transportation from Asia. Um, but it's an example of showing all of the different modes of transportation, the, the multimodal, the intermodal transport, and how complex these things can be. Because each leg of the transport can include or implicate a different law, different countries' law, different legal regime. So that's where these claims get really complex. And we're not necessarily going to go into detail there. We're going to focus more on the inland marine, the uh, commercial auto field, and those type of transportation claims. Um, but I suffice it to say, this topic is hugely important because everything you have, look at your cell phone. I'm looking at my uh, my Contigo coffee cup. All of these things came, you know, originated from primarily other countries and are transported via multimodal transportation. And they're subject to, I mean, obviously, cargo claims of all shapes and sizes. So really, that's what we'll discuss. So just to begin, Valerie, tell me a little bit about yourself and, and what you're doing for the Crawford Company or Crawford and Company. So uh, Ashton, I started out in, in law. So I have a legal background. I'm a certified paralegal. Uh, did law for about 25 years, a lot of contractual work. Um, and I was by accident happened into the insurance industry and became part of claims years ago. And uh, cargo is such a specialty niche. Uh, Not a lot of people are real experts at it. And there's so much to know. It's different terminology. It's just, it's a different type of claim. Um, So I got very interested in it, trying to find better processes, better ways to be efficient, better understanding of how freight travels, how it gets damaged, who's responsible, how does CARMAC apply, and various other things. So it just became a a real focus for me. So I've trained others in that field. I've done a lot of work with uh, subrogation, Uh, done a lot of work with international freight, domestic freight, air freight. Um, So for Crawford, we are a third-party loss adjusting firm, and we adjust cargo claims for the commercial transportation unit, which 
cargo is a uh, unique element within that unit. What makes us different is um, I like to produce good quality reporting. I like to really formulate the details, make sure it's clear so that these claims can be adjusted effectively. Um, I'm a member of the National Transportation Association, Women in Trucking, uh, TIDA, Georgia Motor Trucking, and Southern Loss Association. So um, I do my best to stay actively involved and uh, try and help others as often as I can. Excellent. Well, that is great. So uh, just to get a better understanding, uh, and we've discussed this previously, you, you're dealing with, uh, you see subrogation and you're also seeing other aspects of the cargo claim, correct? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when you talk about other aspects of the cargo, I mean, cargo is really important when it comes down to how is the cargo loaded? Uh, did the shipper do their part? Did they secure the load? It is, is it a no touch load? Did the motor carrier driver have any part in that loading? Um, how was it secured? Was it blocked? Was it braced? Uh, what was the load pattern? So all these types of cargo, whether it's heavy equipment, whether it's dry freight, whether it's a reefer load, um, whether it's bulk cargo, uh, whether it's liquid, liquid is another modality that changes how transport occurs. And how do you, how do you dissect the liability? Was it the motor carrier? Is it general over the road transport movement? Uh, is it load securement? Uh, where does the fault lie? And that's the tricky part because there's so many elements to cargo that plays into uh, who's responsible, who's liable for the damage, or is it a shared responsibility? So these are all dynamics uh, that play a part. And then when you get into the subrogation end of it, could there be an outside source uh, that is part of that liability or that contributed to the loss? Um, is there fault elsewhere? Absolutely. And now, as a team manager for cargo claims, I'd really imagine that you have some really excellent, amazing insight into how the claims are handled you know, on the ground. Now, what are some significant hurdles that you found in handling these claims in your role? So um, we choose to be a little proactive uh, when we're assigning a field adjuster to do inspections. So inspections, you know, everybody's heard of four-point inspections on a vehicle, right? Um, but when it comes to cargo, Cargo inspections and investigation is a little different. So let's face it, you have Gaylords, uh, which is a type of packaging for cargo. You have pallets. You have uh, linear strapping units inside a dry van. If it's a flatbed, you have lateral strapping accessibility. And depending on how many cleats are on that flatbed. And then you also have FMCSA, which is load securement requirements. So FMCSA 393, 100 to 106. That's where you'll find load securement requirements for different types of cargo, like coils of steel. Um, so a lot of your field adjusters, it's challenging because you have to direct them into what are you photographing? What are you investigating? So you want labels, you want the pallets. Uh, if you're talking about rolls of paper, rolls of coils, is the diameter of those rolls out of round? And if they are, are they measured? They have to evaluate how far out of round because they can be reworked. So that plays into salvage, that plays into recycle, that plays into repurposing. Because many of these large rolls are used for further fabrication. So will they fit on the machines? Will they work on the machines? So our challenges are the field. Not a lot of people understand cargo. So you have to look for all the nuances. Um, the labeling provides a lot of information. Does it say this, this end up? Uh, also, you have to look at how the packages are laid out on the pallet. If the packaging extends beyond the pallet, your center of gravity is out of balance. Um, if there's no dunnage, let's just say your load is a hopscotch, one, two, one, two, one, two. You have vacant or void space in that trailer. If there's no dunnage or support to prevent movement or friction mats, your over the road movement is going to cause shifting. Have, has there been loads that are heavy on top for lighter products on the bottom? If that happens, you're going to have crushing. You're going to have shifting. Um, so those are challenges because when you inspect, you have to look at all of these elements, fire losses. Where's the burn patterns? Where's the heat spots? Uh, how is it affected? How was the, you know, when the fire department showed up, did they, you know, fire retardants, how much was used? 
you know, is the, what part of that cargo, and this is where the field adjusters get challenged, is what part of the cargo is good and what part is bad? And can you appropriate a percentage? Do you have salvage? Do you have a total loss? So those are the things we try and be proactive and guide our field adjusters so that when we get those reports and results back, they're efficient for that desk adjuster to do a thorough dive into the claim. And, and that's that's huge. I mean, the investigation on these cargo claims is you know similar to almost a product liability claim where you absolutely have to put the time in up front to figure out what occurred because evidence deteriorates. You know, there aren't always mm-hmm. photographs. So getting out there and to get that document, everything actual solidified up front can be hugely important. You know, you, you, you mentioned the dunnage and right, the be it straps or cardboard used to secure the cargo. We see a ton of rollover cases mm-hmm. uh, where there's a rollover caused by and this is tangentially, you know, related to cargo claims, because oftentimes in those cases, we have the property damage or, you know, the damage to the trailer or tractor. In those cases, it's a lot about going back to figure out, hey, was was cardboard done as used when it should have been plastic or wood? Did they improperly load in the way that it should have been a straight line of pallets rather than staggered or vice versa? Mm-hmm. So I mean, it, investigation is huge. And that's one thing I know that we're going to talk about in depth in this upcoming webinar. <laughs> And, and another important thing is that while you, I mean, you are a specialist, right? You and I both handle these claims day in and day out. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people that listen are listening to this podcast, will be listening to the webinar. You know, they might only, you know, seldomly, but relatively regularly handle cargo claims. We have a lot of homeowners carriers where if we have a tip over of, uh, or let's say car, just cargo damage to household goods, right? They're insuring those. So maybe they work, you know, that's 5% of the claims or 2% of the claims where they don't have this profound knowledge, but they need to have a basic understanding. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why this is hugely important. Uh, I mean, so in your mind, you know, why do you think understanding cargo claims is so important? Because almost everything we do has some element of cargo. If you If you drill down on an adjuster and their core skills, Okay, Um, and I use this with with people that I'm training. If if you have good core investigative skills and you're inquisitive by nature and it's kind of like peeling back an onion. okay? and parents do this with children. Right. Uh, Two kids get in a fight. Who started it? Who's the cause? What was what was the core reason? You got to start peeling back the details to get to the root cause. That applies in so many areas of our normal everyday life. And whether it's a a physical damage claim, whether it's cargo claim, whether it's liability, bodily injury, at the end of the day, you're still peeling back the layers. It's just a matter of which type of layers. And all those details play a part in effectively adjusting a claim because while there's core policies out there, you have motor truck cargo policies, you have Uh, APD physical damage policies, and so on. You have GL and and various others. They all have, you know, conditions, exclusions, requirements within that policy. Your best guess in determining coverage or your best best assessment in determining coverage is to have all the answers, peel back that onion, understand all the details. And if you apply those same skills to cargo, to whichever claim you're doing, you're going to come up with a very well-written report and you're going to have all your answers, uh, all your questions answered, which is key. Absolutely. Um, No, broadly applicable. I mean, we have homeowners carriers, auto insurers, cargo insurers, uh, commercial auto carriers, you know, Almost everybody and most people in this field are touching on cargo claims, at least in some regards. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's why, you know, I've given cargo 101 presentations on a number of occasions. And people are kind of amazed when they start hearing about the unique legal regimes and how cargo is so different. I mean, this isn't just a standard tort claim where we have to prove up negligence. Usually it's going to be strict liability, but there's other situations where negligence is applicable. Uh, One thing that we'll go through in the webinar that I want to touch on now is just it's a fascinating history on how we got to the current legal regime of the Carmack Amendment and different aspects of strict liability in uh, in cargo. Uh, interestingly enough, the first modern contracts of insurance ever were those in insuring marine cargo. It's a transportation uh, in between different countries hundreds of years ago, originating in Greek and Roman maritime law, even a lot of this. You know, actually, the first ships bound, you know, our founding fathers coming to the United States 
those were ships bound largely for commerce and in merchant ships that were insured or quasi insured under some of the first insurance policies that were ever drafted. Uh, so this is a long standing law, right? This is this isn't a new development. We've been dealing with this for centuries. Um, initially, it was strict liability, and that's kind of how ocean carriage operated. And you know, then that applied to horses and wagon, and then to railroad, and much later, and today, to auto and commercial auto. Um, interestingly enough, the reason why we have the Carmack Amendment today is that in the early 20th century, in the United States, you had all of these different state laws that were applicable to a, to a cargo claim, right, to damage that occurred in whatever state, where that state law is applicable because there's no federal law regulating all of this, no cohesive regulatory framework. So instead, you could have an incident that occurred in Illinois, and there you have to prove negligence and prove the motor carrier, you know, they swerved off the road, they were negligent, they damaged the cargo, that's why you're responsible. Uh, but then in another state, maybe Oklahoma, they had strict liability where we don't care what happened. The damage just happened while you had custody and control. So you motor carrier are responsible. So what happened is to be consistent, the government passed the Carmack Amendment, the, the federal legislature. And what they did is they applied strict liability to all claims through Carmack that involve interstate transportation. So that's when states go, you know, obviously that load crosses the state line. Now it's subject to well, the, the Commerce Clause and strict liability now under the Carmack Amendment, which pretty much just in a nutshell, what Carmack is. And if there's one major important thing to take away, it's just a general understanding of what is Carmack. And what it is, is it's uh, it's provide strict liability. So instead of my having to prove, hey, motor carrier, this is what you did that was negligent, you're responsible because of that. Instead, it's just all I need to do is show it's a one condition at origin, it's in a worse condition at destination. I've made my case, right? That's it. It's strict liability. That motor carrier is responsible if the damage occurs when they have the load. Now, there's a series of defenses, which we'll actually give a bunch of examples on in the webinar. Defenses such as, you know, if it's a riot or civil disturbance, um, if it was an issue with the product in general, right? If, if, for example, somebody were to ship a load of oranges that expire in two days, but they know it's a five-day shipment, well, then the motor carrier is not responsible. Um, other defenses such as act of God, that's a big one we litigate all the time. I have 500 examples of situations where damage occurs and they claim it was because of a rainstorm. Oftentimes, actually, you know, we can argue, well, you should have done something. You should have covered. You should have used a different trailer to avoid the rain. You should have checked the forecast. Either way, there are some defenses. But the biggest thing to keep in mind is you know, the general idea that under Carmack, it's strict liability, and that's what applies. Now, now, Valerie, I know that you have a very deep knowledge of Carmack. Um, anything you want to add to this or any examples you have? Well, Ashton, I, I think you know everybody gets afraid when they hear that word. You know, the freight brokers throw it out there all the time. Uh, you know, you have nine months to typically nine months to file a claim under uh, for a cargo loss. But of course, everybody forgets that there's also statute of limitations by state. So technically, when it comes to property loss, they do even have more time if, if it were to become a litigated situation. Um, but under Carmack, yes, the cargo is in that motor carrier's care, custody and control. However, there, if there is viable proof that shows or somebody cannot prove the condition of the cargo at the origin to show whether or not that cargo was in good condition, and if we cannot show an event during transport, we support it with GPS, we can prove the securement is there, we can prove the carrier had no events during transport, we can then shift that back to a shipper's liability. And, and we've been very successful in proving this where, you know, obviously it's in the care custody control, but if the carrier was not negligent and there is no proof of that negligence, but we can prove that there's negligence on the part of the shipper while they don't have any requirement requirement for that, we can show that. And if we can show that shipper incorrectly loaded, that shipper didn't do their part or cause damage at the origin we can shift that liability. Do you have an example of uh, somewhere, some a case or mm -hmm. even a hypothetical case that you can come up with the issue we is do. the condition at origin? Now, what's we that? do. So we had, um, we had barrels of honey and the barrels, they put too many barrels on a pallet 
And those barrels were all butted up against each other. And the way those metal barrels are is they have a, they have a cap and a lid and that, that rim has a buckle on it of sorts, which kind of crank, clamps down on it. So what happens is when they shrink wrapped all those barrels on this one pallet, they overloaded the pallet. So with the natural over the road movement, we supported there were no events during transport on the GPS. There were no hard braking. There was no uh, excessive speed. We had a dash cam to confirm the speed of, of the motor carrier. Um, he used internal load bars and strapping to do his best to add additional securement. But the original pallets were stacked and loaded by the shipper. And when they shrink wrap those barrels, too many of them, what they did is they created compression. And when they created compression, it loosened the buckles, which lifted some of the lids, causing the liquid inside to spill over. And of course, that becomes contaminated. Now, some of that was reworked. We were able to salvage a lot of it, but we did have some damage on that load. But we were able to shift that back to the shipper because our driver took pictures before they closed the trailer doors. And a lot of times drivers are told you can't be on the dock. You can't be near the load. You know, the, the shippers will load everything. You sit in your cab. I always tell our motor carriers, ask the, the, um, uh, the shipper before you close those trailer doors, please let me take a picture or here's my phone. Please take a picture of the load before you close the trailer doors and put a seal on it. Well, that particular picture allowed us to see that this load was not loaded correctly. We were able to shift that claim back to the shipper and it was not on the motor carrier. So again, pictures are worth a thousand words. If your driver is not sure, have them right on the bill of lading. This load is loaded incorrectly or they have the right to refuse transport on that load if they choose to if they feel it's unsafe or inappropriate. So the driver has a lot more control than one might think. Now, most people, most drivers don't refuse to take a load, but at the very least take the pictures before those doors are closed because it gives us the ability to look at that load before they even started down the road and then take a look at that load and make comparisons when that load arrived. And, and what resulted in between. There is natural over the road movement that occurs with any transport. The question is, did that shipper do their job in making sure that load was properly secured to start with? That's a great and, example. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. And you have to, you have to have, you also have to trigger coverage, right? So that in order to trigger that insuring agreement for responsibility on the part of the a motor carrier, we have to show that the motor carrier was actually negligent, that there was a, the motor carrier caused the damage. Well, if the motor carrier did not cause the damage, we, we can't trigger coverage. Absolutely. So that's a great example because really what happened there in your, in your honey example is Carmac claims make claims made under Carmac. You've raised a defense saying that it was the way that the shipper loaded or something the shipper did. So then it's a burden shifting and the burden then shifts back to the shipper to be able to prove that that isn't the case. And we, that's basically what we see with those uh, act of God claims, right? They come back and say, oh, well, you know, this, I'll, I'll give you an example. I had a case a couple of years ago where Maserati is being transported from Wisconsin to Florida. Uh, somewhere during the transport, uh, there was a water loss. Uh, it happened to be that one of the back windows, the flap was actually broken and uh, water came through. They park it in the garage at the insured's location. They leave it there for two weeks. Next thing you know, insured gets to their house on vacation and the vehicle was, I mean, imagine as if the seats were just like a fuzzy vinyl of black mold and there were white seats. Uh, it was disgusting. But we were able to look at that and, you know, we made the claim and we made the argument that this occurred during transport. They came back and they said, nope, act of God. It was a bad hurricane. You know, we can't help that. To which we then have to go back and confront that. And we are arguing in that situation. Well, no, that's not true. First off, if there's a hurricane, you probably shouldn't have been on the road. Secondly, if there was a hurricane, you really should have used a covered trailer. We looked on the bill of lading. They actually had guaranteed a covered trailer. They didn't use one. Mm -hmm. um, the other aspect, then we had to go back and we talked about condition and origin. But then we had to talk about damage condition at destination. 
because the defendant then raises the allegation and says, well, here's the deal. The condition wasn't damage of destination. There was some water on the seat. The fact is that your insured didn't inspect it. You didn't notice it. And because it sat there for two weeks, that's why the mold occurred. Uh, okay. Interestingly enough, we actually were able to hire an expert who was able to take uh, mold spore samples and give an opinion on exactly when the water would have came in within, you know, I think one day to show the growth level from the water intrusion. And we were able to use that to show that the damage would not have been noticeable when the insured would have been there, even if they were day there, day one, and that the defendant motor care was still responsible. So that's where these things get tricky. These can be fascinating cases. And it's not as simple as just, I think, as, as Valerie mentioned, just, hey, you're strictly liable. Um, but that is kind of the, the regime we sent around, right? These claims usually asserted against a motor carrier. If there's a defense raised, it's a defense based on one of about 10 factors. And then the burden shifts. Plaintiff has to then prove the case. So that's really fascinating stuff. Um, and, you, and you also have you, you, today, you, um, I'm sorry, I shouldn't mean to interrupt. Um, just a quick, a quick note today, the trend is wrongful rejection. So the receiver just throws up their hands because they know there was something that happened during transport and sight unseen, they're rejecting the load. And that's not possible either. Right. Of, we do with load rejections all the time. Uh, and one interesting thing about the load rejections, you see more and more often, especially with uh, be it FDA regulated items, food. Oh, right where you might have uh, an allegation of a break to the seal. I've had a situation where the seal had a small, and this was like a, a big zip tie, had a small break and it couldn't prove that it came off. They rejected the load. And then we're sitting here trying to figure out what to do. Um, I've had scenarios where they argue that the, you know, obviously the load's been contaminated if it's been opened. Uh, I had a great one where it was just, it was, it was opened by the consignee, the right place, but not per the appropriate procedure and protocol. So even though it was an employee of the consignee and the consignee is the person who's being delivered to, it wasn't the right employee. So they then rejected the load. That's one we were able to argue and win on. I had another one where, you know, the wrong, per they delivered it to the wrong location. They opened the load. They realized it's the wrong load. They closed it up. They brought it to the right location and then was rejected. In that situation, they legitimately right. op- opened the opened the doors, and a b- few birds started flying out. So that was, you know, that was an appropriate rejection. But rejections can be fascinating uh, because they come in all shapes and sizes. Right. Mm-hmm. So, Valerie, what are the biggest hurdles that you've seen in your practice in proving applicability of Carmack and either recovering or even denying claims in that regard? So, for Carmack, um, you know. I think I think you have to have a solid case. I mean, everybody is always under the premise that it's always the motor carrier's fault. So, um, and this is where we can get into double brokering and other issues. And again, we talk about triggering coverage. At the end of the day, your claim has to support the details. You're, you have to be able to identify everything from inception to completion. Because if that claim is asserted and they're saying it's motor carrier's fault, you have to show why it may or may not be. And so for Carmack, I'm, I'm cautious with that because we do have challenges. You know, there's some of these brokers have gone to uh, getting in-house attorneys um, and, and they're starting to push back a little bit more. But at the end of the day, we still have a contractual agreement. We still have Carmack in place. We still have a motor carrier that transported the load. So I think it's an adjuster's duty to make sure, especially with cargo, um, that you uncover all of the details. And those challenges are hard because sometimes you've got missing pieces. Sometimes you have shippers that will not cooperate. I mean, I have a claim right now where it was a complete shipper's loading. They did everything and they did not block and brace a heavy equipment load on a flatbed. And when it got to the consignee, they were talking about $33,000 to tear down the equipment to see if there was any internal damage, but there was no justification for that. And they left the product outside in the elements for three months, which could have caused further damage. So at the end of the day, you have to make sure that you have pushed as hard as you can for that paperwork, because when you make that final declination, if if that's what you choose to do in your claim... You have to make sure that you've supported all of it because more often than not, you're going to get an attorney that's going to come back and assert, Carmack, it's the motor carrier's fault. Well, you have to be prepared as the adjuster, and that's how I train my people. Be prepared for the pushback. 
be anticipate that you're going to get pushback if we're floating Carmack out there because you have to be able to support that claim. So detailed reporting, going the extra mile, making sure that you've closed in all the avenues that could be um, um, ambiguous, that could be open for interpretation, try and close those doors as best you can. Um, and that's going to be your best chance for, for success. Excellent. And I think this is why, Valerie, you have such a unique perspective is because you're not just the subrogation adjuster, right? You're not only dealing with that, uh, like many of my clients are. I mean, you, you are actually handling a lot of different aspects of that cargo claim. So you have perspectives from both the even the, the liability defense side, you know, the first party coverage side, all of the above. So it's really interesting stuff. Now, from that experience, are are there any practical tips uh, that adjusters or other attorneys can really utilize in investigating the cargo claims? So I find that um, I find that uh, GPS. Uh, m- most people use uh, vendors like Motive. Motive is a company that tracks and monitors and provides reporting for GPS within uh, tractor trailers. That has become very useful in rebutting comments like, oh, well, he slammed on the brakes. Well, no, he didn't. Well, he took a really hard turn. Well, no, he didn't. So we we can argue back when those assertions come up. The other thing, too, is when you're looking at load patterns. Okay, if a if a load, so your typical load is 45,000 pounds in a in a 53-foot dry van. But if your load is heavy on the axles, if it's more concentrated, your tires, the tires are going to stick and that ends up causing a rollover. So when your tractor trailers are going, you know, over a clover leaf or, you know, off ramp, on ramp, um, it can tend, especially if you're hauling things like the steel coils, the large, large paper rolls, big bulky product that's heavy. It's going to, if it's heavy on the axle, those tires are going to stick. So, when you get a rollover, you want to ask yourself, well, why? Okay, was there a dash cam? Uh, how fast was that driver going? Were there uh, weather elements that came into play? Uh, was there a phantom vehicle? Did anything else happen? If none of those things occurred, then, it's, then chances are your load is heavy near the axles. And those tires did not negotiate that turn appropriately because the weight was not evenly distributed. We see this a lot with uh, beverage loads, Coke cans, beer, alcohol, heavy, heavy loads that the modality, you've got liquid inside. That liquid, because there's no stabilizers inside, that liquid is moving. It's shifting all the time. So depending on how that load is secured, if it's not you have to go back to that because that could be a contributing factor to your rollover. So these are like, th- these are things that you learn along the way, assertions of water damage, assertions of contamination. Well, I would call out microbial testing because if you have water, it could be condensation, could not be contamination. It could just be simply sweat from the trailer due to humidity, depending on time of year, uh, temperature. Um, so I'm always careful with that. Uh, Reefer loads, when you get into uh, a declination for, or I'm sorry, rejection for um, uh, temperature abuse, too hot, uh, you can read your data downloads and you can look at the return air. You can tell if a load was loaded too hot. That's a starting point. That's not the driver's fault. That's the shipper's fault. Was it pre-cooled? If someone's asserting a rejection based on pulp temps, Motor carriers are not responsible for pulp temps. They're responsible for making sure their reefer maintains proper function. And if you can prove that and the data log shows no alarm codes, that's not a viable rejection. Even if they have a sensor inside, a temp tail, because that's that's another piece of equipment, right, that requires calibration annually. So what if it's not working correctly and your data log says that the reefer worked just fine? They have to come up with more physical evidence to demonstrate that the motor carrier was negligent. Oh, yeah. And what? Go ahead. Those are are tips and tricks. Those are great tips and tricks. Everyone listen in on those. Those are excellent. And there's going to be even more during the webinar. So make sure you attend. Um, So 
during our prior conversation, and you and I had a conversation prior to this podcast, I asked for you know some thoughts on what are some important things that you think we should talk about and should be mentioned. And one thing you mentioned was uh, the idea of double broker loads and uh, MAP21. Uh, can you walk me through uh, your thoughts on those items? Sure. Um, MAP21 went into play around December 2013. So it's been out there a long time. And basically, uh, anybody that's tendering a load to a motor carrier has to have authority to broker that load. If they're not authorized to do so and they don't carry a $75,000 bond, they're not allowed to tender a load to another motor carrier. And what happens sometimes is depending on how lucrative that rate or that line haul is, sometimes motor carriers will split the load. So let's just say TQL, Total Quality Logistics, decides to tender a load to ABC Freight. ABC Freight says, "Uh, I don't have enough equipment, don't want to do it. I'm going to tender it to my buddy, um, you know, ABD Freight, and they're going to take it. Well, the problem is ABC Freight is a licensed motor carrier. They have authority to be a motor carrier, but they do not have authority to broker loads. So what happens is whose policy is going to respond? And one of the reasons MAP21 got into play was to create transparency in the chain of responsibility. There has to be, and a lot of times on these loads, when you have a contractual agreement with a uh, broker, you have a broker carrier agreement. I always encourage everybody to ask for a broker carrier agreement because it sets forth terms and conditions, indemnity clauses, and it quite often will speak to brokering loads or double brokering or subcontracting. Sometimes you'll hear a motor carrier say, well, I used a subhaul agreement. Well, that's great. Subhaul agreement just means you subcontracted out another motor carrier, but that has nothing to do with proper properly tendering a load. So these laws were put into place. So 49 USC 13901 is a good reference, 13902 FMCSA. These are all uh, legislation that talks about double brokering. It is illegal. It's not allowed. People do it anyway, though. It happens all the time. I recently had a claim where it got rather complicated. Um, A freight broker uh, tendered a load to one motor carrier. That motor carrier then brokered it to his sister company. However, that motor carrier that it was initially tendered to did not have authority to broker loads. Well, there was a fire. There was hazmat cleanup there was record recovery, there were a ton of expenses associated with this loss. And, and it, was a, it was an Uber freight load. Everybody was looking for payment. The problem is the motor carrier that had the cargo, the policy would not respond because it was not a properly tendered load. And under the policy, the policy requires a legal contractual agreement, which is the bill of lading. If the bill of lading does not have the motor carrier on it and and all the proper information, you don't have a properly tendered load, which also is accompanied by the rate confirmation sheet. So needless to say, that claim was denied. And the motor carrier that's going to respond to that is actually going to be ABC Freight. Now, if ABC Freight then wants to subrogate against their own sister company to recoup what was paid, that's their choice but you have to be able to trigger coverage and that's only going to be triggered by a legal tender of freight. And we quite often see these claims just obviously given the multimodal nature and the fact that, I mean, the, the trucking industry, I mean, you see this all the time where you have just this chain of different operators where you could have, you know, there's a broker who sub brokers who brings in a motor carrier brings in then improperly brokers it out. Um, oftentimes when we're handling these cases, uh, we'll see situations like ABC Freight there where they didn't pro- properly broker. They didn't have the authority to do so. Then they argue that, oh, we are a broker. We should be protected by the rules governing claims against brokers, which would limit claims against brokers. were really limited to negligent entrustment claims, right? They're not just typically contractually just responsible. Um, but against the ABC Freight there, if they didn't do it appropriately, then they can be held responsible just as that first in line motor carrier. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, one thing important to note is Quite often, we'll have situations we're seeing more and more because uh, there's a lot of really small operating companies, 
and even some small brokers out there. And what we'll see is broker will just, uh, you know, take the, I mean, have the load, pick it up, post it. Next thing you know, they're, uh, okay, yeah, we picked this, you know, the, here's, here's the, the motor carrier we're using. They do no due diligence. They just pick somebody out by, you know, what's the, what's the first letter in the name of the company? Beautiful. They then obviously tend to the load to that motor carrier. Well, there's an obligation on that broker to ensure that they have adequate insurance. Usually that's in the contract with their client. Um, and in a lot of times, that's really what we're stuck with. So quite often we are able to prove, and that would be assuming a situation where, let's say, that motor carrier had coverage that was denied, which we see all the time for situations such as uh, an excluded driver, right? Mm-hmm. Um, ABC Insurance Company insures that motor carrier they have a listed driving, they have excluded drivers on there and that driver's driving. Or it's a listed uh, tractor policy where it's an unlisted vehicle, so they don't cover it. We see those denials and the next thing you know, we go back and uh, we have to prove negligent entrustment against that broker. So that's where these things get even more complex because we're not just talking about claims now against the motor carrier. We're also talking about potential claims against the broker. Um, so yeah, just to add to the complexities here, which is uh, which is fascinating. Um, oh, yeah, and then you get into contingent policies, um, where that where the actual broker has to, you know, if you've got a denied claim from a motor carrier, that contingent policy for the broker is going to kick in. And you can have contingent policies where the contingent cargo coverage isn't going to cover it because the broker is not negligent, but that broker then has a contract with their with their client that otherwise mm-hmm. makes them liable. So we we see that all the time. So, I mean, another reason why we always say to all of our clients, get me everything. Obviously, the bill of lading is the the Bible. I mean, it has most everything we need on there. But there's also going to be all contracts and agreements between the parties that could come into play. Um, One other important thing to note is when we talk about Carmack and these cargo claims, this is applicable to common carriers. And most of the vehicles transporting cargo interstate that we see, I mean, they are common carriers subject to Carmack. But there is also the ability to have contract carriage. So just uh, we don't need to go into that because that's a whole presentation in and of itself. <laughs> uh, but something just, uh, you know, a little uh, addendum to an addendum there. Oh, yeah. So now, Valerie, do you have any, uh, I always like to have a, a lighter part to the conversation. Any funny stories or unique claims that uh, that you've handled that you think are worth sharing? Actually, yeah, I do. Um, so we had uh, we, we had a motor carrier. Um, wonderful guy out of Texas. Uh, he was carrying cayenne mash. So for those of you who don't know what cayenne mash is, it's literally red sauce. So the red sauce was in bulk bags in large Gaylords, Gaylords, which are, you know, big cardboard containers. And there were 21 pallets with 21 Gaylords. And our motor carrier went along just fine while the, one of the sacks was overfilled and it burst just based on over the road. And we had red sauce everywhere, absolutely everywhere. So um, our guy pulled into a hotel because we were, he was waiting. We, we wanted to get it inspected immediately because the consignee rejected the entire load, all 21 pallets. Now we did have splatter. We had some sauce on the ground, but the other 20 pallets were in perfect condition there was, you know, some little bit of red splatter on the cardboard, but there was no contamination, no intrusion or penetration to the other uh, product. So our argument was, okay, there's there's one pallet. Well, nobody was helping out this poor guy and all the people in the area for disposal because, you know, they would not accept it. Now, doesn't mean we were going to pay for all 21 pallets. We were willing to pay for one, um, but that wasn't acceptable. But nonetheless, it they wouldn't take it. So all this, imagine you've got $16,000 worth of sauce and you've got tons of sauce that has to be disposed now. Where do you dispose of it? So there's nobody in the area that would take it. This poor guy had to take it back to Texas and he had to dig a big hole in his on his grounds, on his property. He had to do multiple holes to dispose of the load himself. And the oh, poor wow. guy, the poor guy, he called me back and he said, I don't know that I'm ever going to eat red sauce again. <laughs> <laughs> he had, he had sauce everywhere, but they wanted to charge him over $20,000 to dispose of the load. It was actually more than the load was worth. Wow. 
that, so, that's, that's a good one. I like that story. It's just, it, you know, these poor truckers, um, you know, your heart goes out to them sometimes because they, they are left with some perplexing issues on what to do. Because many of these receivers, it's just a hard and fast. Nope, we don't want it. We don't want to touch it. We don't look at it. And it's like, well, you can't do that. You can't just throw your hands up and not accept a load. But at the end of the day, it, it leaves the motor carrier with some perplexing decisions because not always, there's not always resources to help them depending. These products are all different. Monolithic glass, well, there's a threshold for recycling. So if it's monolithic or architectural glass, they won't recycle it. So that becomes challenging if you have large sheets of glass. There's all kinds of restrictions when it comes to recycling or disposal. Uh, many of these landfills won't take certain products. Well, then what do you do with it? So you have to be, you have to learn to become very creative. So as an adjuster of cargo, uh, your best bet is to make really good friends with tow yards uh, because you can call in favors and they will help you at times. Other, other friends that are good to have are disposal companies or landfills or recycle places because you may need to call on those favors when you're up against decisions that, you know, what do you do? Yeah, so you don't have to pour a bunch of red sauce in your backyard. <laughs> That's right. That you know, multiple holes in your backyard with red sauce everywhere. So, yeah, I mean, he was creative, but that was the only solution he could come up with, and he was an owner operator. So, you know, that becomes a choice. He didn't have twenty thousand dollars to pay to dispose, and you know, we weren't going to trigger coverage based on the denial, so he wasn't going to have coverage for that disposal. I'm just waiting for the sinkhole claim from that, where somebody falls into <laughs> a, you know, a 20 year old uh, vat of red sauce. Well, let's just, let's just hope that's not the case, but that, that was his choice and that's what he chose to do. And we didn't learn about it till after the fact. Yeah. W- one thing I'll mention though, is you make a great point regarding the full rejection or semi rejection, partial rejection of a load. We see cases all the time where yeah, it could be, let's say it's a load of lumber, right? And there's a defect in a number of boards, right? Even a small percentage, 15% of the boards. Well, a lot of, I mean, a lot of consignees, the party was being shipped to, I mean, they're rejecting the load in full. And then the motor carrier is trying to, what what do I do now, right? There's going to be some sort of leeway, some give. There's always going to be some pieces, especially with lumber transport, where some are not exactly what's expected. Uh, And at that point, you know, there's a lot of back and forth because my my client carriers, they get calls. They say, well, what do we do now? They rejected the whole load. And then what? They have to drive it all the way back or they have to dispose of it. Um, so, so that stuff gets fascinating. That's litigated all the time. There are great companies out there, Front Street Commodities, uh, Benedict Company, uh, Ritchie Brothers. There are many large salvers out there that have contacts and connections all over the United States. And we strive very hard to mitigate and salvage every chance we can get. Um, I had a Dow chemical claim that involved a moisture retardant for cabling. And it was a, it was over a hundred thousand dollar load and Dow chemical was fixated on, you know, that was going to be the claim. And I said, ah, I've done some research here. I know you can repurpose this. And it was, you know, it was a certain controlled. It was a certain type of unit. It was airtight. They had all kinds of restrictions and requirements around it uh, for functionality and proper performance. Um, but at the end of the day, I pushed hard enough and I was able to get them to reduce the claim down to 58000 So when somebody says initially, no, 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 can't be recycled, can't be, we can't do anything with it. Do a little research, go on Google, find out what the product is used for, find out its purposes and how it's manufactured, get as much information as you can. It might tell you a lot more than you might know initially. And I find it gives me a lot of extra details and points of argument or discussion, if you will, um, with the parties to say, look, I know what this is used for. I know what you're doing. Um, we could, you can use it for this other purpose, or you, could you use it over here? Or how can you repurpose this material? There has to be a way to reduce the cost of the claim. And if you push back enough, a lot of times they'll finally give in. And the fact of the matter is they don't want to go through the effort. So their initial response is, no, nope, there's nothing we can do. 
but when actuality there is something they can do and i think it's our duty to push as best we can to get whatever reductions or discounts we can achieve so that must be the the legal training in you to not just take everyone's word for everything <laughs> um, that's 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 important uh, if you want to take a tip from this it's a uh, it's don't trust anybody. I think that's except for your legal counsel. I mean, usually you want to be able to trust them, but otherwise I I think that's a great word of advice, Valerie. Um, Now I think we're nearing the end of the podcast. One thing I do want to mention is there's several other, many other items we'll talk about the webinar. One being uh, released rate provisions Uh, in a nutshell, that's uh, under Carmack. You can't necessarily negotiate out of being responsible but you can negotiate and have terms relating to how much you're responsible for. A lot of times you'll see for these claims that no, you're not responsible for the full $200,000 in cargo, but motor care is responsible for 90 cents per pound or others that are full value. And that's all marked on the bill of lading. So we'll go through in the presentation, you know, how to review a bill of lading, uh, all of the above there. We'll go through notice rules uh, and Valerie briefly touched on that, uh, but basically there's very profound and concrete notice requirements to notice up that motor carrier after the loss is noticed and damaged, even if it's not marked on the bill of lading, which it should be, um, there are ways to go about it. We'll mention COGSA, which is the Carriage of Goods by Sea Act, which deals with marine transport and uh, global transportation by ocean liner, um, airway transportation, Montreal Convention, a few other items there. And then we'll talk about some other you know, random ones, such as claims against uh, brokers, as we discussed, claims against warehouses under bailment theory, and different items like that. So I do strongly encourage everybody if you're available tune in on june 5th for the clm webinar um that's all we have for you today valerie i want to thank you so much for attending we're definitely gonna have to do it again in the future there's a lot to discuss many more topics we could probably talk for another six hours on this but again thank you so much absolutely thank you for having me it was truly a pleasure and uh, good luck everybody out there thank you excellent Well, this is Ashton Kirsch signing off with the Subrogation Support Network podcast. Until next time.